Ho, 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 one and all. And I do mean that with an emphasis on the ho. Welcome to Everything's Gay, even the straight stuff, and the uh, season finale for season two or series two, uh, since my fabulous co-host Magnus is from the UK and everything is a series instead of a season. Um, and a series finale and a season finale are very different here, but much like Doctor Who, <laughs> will be regenerated and come back for another season. Uh, hello, Magnus. Happy Christmas. War is over. My least favorite holiday song, but Happy Christmas is something they say abroad, <laughs> from what I hear. So <clears throat> that that is indeed correct. A, a very merry Christmas to you yes. as well. Um, it's actually quite interesting to see the different traditions that we have in different parts of the world. Um, I believe so. Over there, I think caroling is a major thing isn't it caroling is a thing people want to do a lot of caroling is a thing mm. that we aspire to do as americans like hands across america mm. but i think caroling is a tradition that most people think about and then don't do but it's like trick-or-treating door to door which isn't done as much here anymore where it's mm. kind of like the nostalgia for it puts it into pop culture but the reality of it is is that i can't think of a single group I've gone caroling with in however many years I've been alive now. So, mm. yeah. Whilst over here, <clears throat> I think something that we have that's a bit more prevalent, um, we have a lot of silent night choir nights. Um, it seemed seen as going to the church for like a nice sort of like somber carols late into the night and such. Oh, we have somber carols late into the night. Uh, Christmas Eve oh. Mass is like a big thing here. Uh, I would argue it's actually more popular than like a Christmas Day service. Uh, mostly, yeah, most, mm. yeah, most people do like a Christmas Eve service here. Um, and of course, we have American Thanksgiving, uh, which happens in November, as opposed to Canadian Thanksgiving, which happens in October. You don't really <laughs> have anything holding the line between Halloween and Christmas, so like. Right on November 1st, you can start decor and Christmas <laughs> celebrations, where as opposed to us, where it starts on November 9th and people either That's... celebrate Thanksgiving or no. I suppose the closest thing we have is Guy Fawkes Night, um, which is also known as Fireworks Night over yes. here as well. Um, uh, but I don't think you guys yeah. have that. Remembering the 5th of November, it's the only thing holding the line from Christmas. <laughs> Uh, but we are going to talk about Christmas today, so I had a really interesting idea of how to do a season finale, and it's going to be um, little vignettes that are related to one movie that then became ubiquitous in especially American pop culture. Uh, but before I explain kind of what the episodes are, I want to know if you, Magnus, have you ever seen It's a Wonderful Life from 1946? Uh, it's one of Jimmy Stewart's most popular roles, uh, probably one of his most visceral roles because he was dealing with his own PTSD through the character, which mm. is, I think, arguably the only thing that works in the movie. Um, but It's a Wonderful Life from 1946 is where we're going to start. Mm. So, sorry, were you, you're asking me a question about that. Yes, have you seen It's a Wonderful Life from 1946? No, I haven't. I will admit this. Um, <clears throat> so, I know it exists. I know it existed for quite some time, but I don't think it's really something that's watched a lot over here. Um, I asked several people before we did this episode, and a lot of people sort of knew the phrase, but they, a lot of them didn't say they'd ever actually seen the film. So I think it's a lot more of an American Christmas holiday film. It is. It is. No, it is an American film about post-war. And mm. so Jimmy Stewart's PTSD in this film is very real. So if you have PTSD mm. or like suicidal ideation, It's a Wonderful mm. Life is not a great movie for you because it's about both of those <laughs> things, really. Um, mm. The interesting thing about It's a Wonderful Life and how ubiquitous mm. it became, and especially why it relates to sitcom and TV pop culture in the 80s and 90s, is that when it came out in 46, people hated it. It was too sweet, too saccharine. The ending just tied up everything too much in a bow. Jimmy Stewart's family and house and the bank is saved. <laughs> it's, it's exhaustingly sweet. It's the less loved film from the person that directed it. The reason that it became a big deal was that 
uh, when TVs became uh, really prevalent in American households, they didn't have anything to play on Christmas when Mm. people were going to be home. And so in that tradition of creating something that then just became a big deal, like uh, like the TV show MASH was saved Mm. from cancellation because it became really popular in syndication. It's a Wonderful Life, essentially, was brought back to life. Um, It's different than Wizard of Oz, where people saw it on TV and fell in love with it again after having like mm. seen it in the movie theater nobody saw it's a wonderful life in the movie theater but because it was on at christmas it became a thing it became an annual running thing because it was easy to get the rights to because it cost virtually nothing and people didn't quite fall in love with it it just became like the elf on a shelf tradition of the 1950s 1960s like the thing yeah. where like everyone's like this is the thing we've been doing forever when elf on a shelf started in 2005 so it's a wonderful life and its journey to becoming sitcom fodder, its journey to being one of the most amusing little moments from one of the Home Alone films. I think it's Home Alone 2, actually. Um, yeah, so so It's a Wonderful Life becoming sitcom fodder is amusing because It's a Wonderful Life was not a wonderful film that everybody loved to begin with. It became something people tolerated, and then it just became the background of our like Christmas lives here in America. Because to be very clear, it is very much about a person dealing with PTSD. Uh, Jimmy Stewart okay. really tapped into his time in the military during the war, and it's it's a hard movie to sit through in certain mm. parts. Um, but it's very America-oriented, so <clears throat> I'm not really surprised it didn't really hit it big in England. Mm. Yes. Um, although I never got a chance to see it, I did do quite a bit of reading on it um, before this episode. And it did really strike me that it really does feel like it's a story of the life and times of an individual and sort of the various um, tribulations they've gone through in their life. Um, so it does feel, feel very much like not so much like um lighthearted or comical, but ra- almost um quite somber in its um storytelling of like the the different trials this person's gone through. Would you say that's what the general feel of it is? I would say it's incredibly somber, and you kind of mm. see that in the sitcom episodes we're going to talk about today. Mm. You kind of okay. see in the way that it's reflected in these different TV shows and how they use it as shorthand okay. for, you know, love the life you have because it could be worse now or in the future. Um, I think Christmas Carol is a much more effective technique, and actually mm. you see a lot of the It's a Wonderful Life bleed over into Christmas Carol especially in the Boy Meets World episode we're going to talk about. Um, right. Because okay. people couch it as a Boy Meets World Christmas Carol episode, but it's really a Boy Meets World It's a Wonderful Life episode. Uh, and so it's this idea of somberness, this idea of like mm. loving the life you have and not wishing for anything else is kind of both something we see in Wizard of Oz, It's a Wonderful Life, and in these episodes specifically. And I was kind of amused by the different tact these shows took and the different messages they learned from it's a wonderful mm-hmm. life it's like they nobody like watched the movie before they made these individual episodes <laughs> but they all kind of come at it from a different angle and it's really cool uh to observe hmm. on a small tangent um the way that you phrased it do you, the way that you just phrased the morals of the movie and such you know what other movie that kind of strikes a chord in me immediately on thinking of what you just said yeah. Um, it sounds very much like the morals that you get from Disney's The Princess and the Frog, because that's the the message behind that movie is feeling content in not what you want, but what you have, and what you have can be just what you need. Um, and I wish it so... were that good. <laughs> I wish <laughs> I wish It's a Wonderful Life were as good as Princess and the Frog. Actually, uh, It's a Wonderful Life suffers heavily from having no movement outside of the city it's set in Mm -hmm. even the version where uh jimmy stewart's character never existed so the whole city for some reason has gone to hell because this one guy didn't exist um even that stays in the city like Mm -hmm. we never see jimmy stewart really in another location even his like 
PTSD stuff about war, we're still very much rooted in the one town. There is no traveling elsewhere. Mm. It's yeah. very, it's a very stuck film in a lot of ways. Okay. I wish it was as good as Princess and the Frog. It's more Sleeping Beauty or like Tangled while she's stuck in the house, you know, kind of thing than it is. <laughs> oh my. Hmm. Kind of makes me want to go rewatch Princess and the Frog now, to be honest. It's a much um, better film. <laughs> so, I think I'll let you lead us with the pace of this episode because um it feels like you've got some good points to go through sarah and i'll feel very interested to hear what they are so what would be your next point so to speak in yeah. this conversation uh well i don't know if they're good points i'm not sure if anyone i don't know sure you, if this is always uh, good sir well well thank you you're very sweet uh so we're actually going to start with uh boy mm -hmm. meets world i'm going to kind of go backwards mm -hmm. in time a little bit. So the Boy Meets World episode is actually the hundredth episode of the series. Okay. Uh, I, I think people don't realize that after Boy Meets World and TGIF parted ways, Boy Meets World continued for a couple of years uh, after TGIF mm. had finished. And so this is from 1997, uh, a very Topanga Christmas from season five, middle of the season. Um, this is the episode where they finished the retcon of Topanga's character from hippie to normie chic. Uh, mm. There's this, the really great podcast that um, uh, Daniel Fisher, who Daniel Fischel, I can never remember share your last name. Uh, so the people that played Sean, Eric and Topanga on Boy Meets World have a podcast where they talk about the episodes and they talk mm. about the aging of the characters and the retconning of Topanga's personality and the back and forth between uh, Corey and Topanga as like the ultimate couple. Like they were trying to do what Harvey and Sabrina did and it just didn't work because they never let the problems get it's... deep enough for them to mm. work as much. Um, All right. but, a, but, a, but a very Topanga Christmas is basically Topanga comes to Corey's house to celebrate the holidays with the Matthews family. And she's basically already been adopted. Like, Corey's whole thing this episode is the idea of I'm going to give her a promise ring, which is very late 90s, Aww. very purity culture, very mm. much like they're heading into the later seasons where they're going to get married and we just don't know when it's going to happen. Mm. Um, it's it's this thing, though, Topanga comes in and she immediately steamrolls over every single Matthews family tradition. She's the least gracious family guest you've ever met. She only wants like special powdered sugar or maple syrup from Vermont for her pancakes. She doesn't want them to put like their like family tree topper on top of the tree. She wants the one from her family instead. She doesn't want Mr. Feeney to do his traditional reading of a Christmas carol. She only wants everyone to act. She basically comes in and she's like the least gracious guest ever into a family that she's known for years and surely already mm. knows. The traditions they have because again she and Corey mm. have been together for a long time at this point we, as friends and it's yeah. like super like Topanga comes in and is like we're changing everything and Corey and Eric really get into it in this episode because mm. Eric is like dude why are you letting your girlfriend steamroll our Christmas and Corey's like I'm gonna tell her no and then we have the It's a Wonderful Life episode showing Corey why he's wrong in like telling her no like, it's an, the worst episode ever about trying to explain a relationship compromise when teenagers mm. are in a relationship. It it sounds very sitcom-y. Um, the, 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 the typical thing where there's a misunderstanding because one character doesn't sort of have perspective on what they're doing and such. You see in, you see it quite a lot. It's a very formulaic um, way to create con conflict and such um but you're saying that he was shown why he was wrong to say no to her it was so this episode much like boy meets world has very mixed messages it's both comes from purity mm -hmm. culture but it's such pure this is like if you ever wanted to learn how to write a sitcom where people change but they don't change boy right. meets world is a perfect sitcom for that uh, okay. Because they, they want it to be a coming-of-age, Wonder Years-style sitcom, mm. Wonder Years-style story, but they want it to be a sitcom where everything is safe, 
So they, at certain points in the series, they retcon Eric, they retcon Sean, they retcon Topanga, all in okay. service of keeping Corey as the main character, essentially, even when he's no longer the most interesting person in the cast. Um, right. Yes. So it's all the. <laughs> so basically, Corey and Topanga get in this huge fight before he can give her a promise ring. He storms out. Sean and uh, Sean and his half brother who is rooming with Eric in college, and so is Sean, even though Sean isn't going to college at this point, I don't think. Um, there's there's a lot going on, plot thread-wise. So yeah. Corey storms over to them and is yeah. like, my girlfriend is being a B. He basically all but says she's, she's being a B, and people call him whipped, and they never... One thing that's nice about Boy Meets World is they never call Corey's masculinity into question. They're very comfortable mm. with their gender construction but like it's this is the episode where if, if they ever came closest to like doing misogyny it was this episode essentially mm. uh and so they have this dream sequence where Corey sees his life without topanga and for some reason he's fat and he only eats the pancakes that she wanted him to have at christmas and she for some reason has married Sean's half brother Jack, so is still hanging around, and they're super successful. And so it's framed as this like Christmas Carol thing with Mr. Feeney, their beloved instructor teacher, as a aggressive Christmas future. But you could also see it as a wonderful life tale because it's very clearly mm -hmm. about the true OTP of the show, the Corey and Topanga relationship, and making sure they're jammed back together. Even yeah. though they've changed her personality like three times, and this is kind of the zenith of the change in her personality, because originally in the show her character is this like really avant-garde, weird hippie girl from a hippie family that would probably mm. celebrate the solstice, um, <laughs> and probably wouldn't cut a tree down. And one of her things is like she wants a real tree instead of the fake aluminum tree that the dad wants to put up. And Alan okay. is the dad is one of the safe hunky dads of 90 sitcom TV. So anyone yeah. stepping to Alan is like making a major no-no. Uh, so A Very Topanga Christmas is this kind of, it's a wonderful life about love relationship, not family relationships. The family relationship is there, but basically the parents serve to be in this episode to not fight back against the guest or be like, hey, you're the guest in our home. Why are you telling your boyfriend to change all of our traditions mm. and why why are we going along with the changing of all the traditions of the um, things our family have done for years you know kind of thing almost sounds like more their set dressing whereas the actual um vehicles of change and direction within yeah. the episode is being the kids who are being treated basically as the adults of yeah the uh scene Oh. In, uh, in in season six, they give the the Matthews parents something to do because they give them another child later in mm -hmm. life. So once the kids go off to college, they have to give them like another young daughter, a la yes. the go the the growing pains that we'll that we'll talk about later. <laughs> mm. Oh, I was going to mention you were saying about purity and everything, and then all of a sudden you mentioned the half brother, and I'm like, oh, a ch a, a child out of marriage. Oh my god, no, but this is this is the Hunter family. So the Hunter family, if you've never seen growing or not if you've never seen Boy Meets World, the Hunter family is like the latchkey kid divorce family of the 90s. They literally live on the literal wrong side of the tracks, literally live oh. in a trailer park. We meet Jack and he'd never been introduced before. The year they went off to the year that Corey and Tabanga go off to college, mm -hmm. they introduced Jack to keep Sean doing something while he's adrift because he's a townie he's the xander mm. of this universe but sean is like the kid with no family but then he magically has a dab and the plot serves it he's the kid that needs love so he's like adopted into the matthews but he's not he's the guy that has an erstwhile father figure and is almost adopted by the cool new english teacher in the middle of like season four and then the cool new uh, English teacher gets in a motorcycle accident because I guess the guy that was cast asked for a pay raise. And so Sean is like the cautionary tale of if you're not good and like Corey, you're going to end up like Sean. And yes, he gets a lot of dates, but like bad stuff happens to him if you're not like 
if you're not main character like Corey, you'll end up having Sean stuff happen to you. And you don't want that. You don't want to live in a trailer with your dad. You want this big suburbanite home and a family that apparently loves you more. I, I don't know. But yeah, Sean and Sean and Sean is like Sean and Jack are the cautionary tale, broken, learning how to talk to each other brothers, but I think they're more functional because they're more honest and more antagonistic. That's that mm. that uh Corey and Eric are really ever allowed to be. Hmm. Dare I say more real in a sense. Um because it's some I, I do recall some of Boy Meets World. It's a again, it's a very American show. And it, I think it was quite a phenomena over in the States. Um I think it only ran once over here. I believe it yeah. was on channel f our channel four. You know, I don't remember there being any repeats of it and such. Um, but I remember it being very f middle class focus, basically. Yeah. It, it's a um, big it's a big staple of the TGIF Americana lineup. Mm. It it has a lot of yeah. uh, it has a lot of feeling like it shared not the time slot, but it shared evenings with earlier or middle Sabrina, I should say. Um, it's it's one of those things that was very of its time, kind of the '90s, very Seventh Heaven um, kind of thing. The the thing about it is is that it's just pure sitcom, so the characters can't change too much, and if they do, they have to be available for retcon at any time. Which is why a a, a rewatch of Boy Meets World will, will show you the weakness of the show because they mm. have to age them up after the first season, essentially, to put them in high school. So there's mm. like this weird, like, we're back now, and Topanga's different. And for some reason, here's now a lot more of Corey's brother, who's for some mm. reason very stupid now. <clears throat> um, and and you really mm. see that in a very Topanga Christmas, that order to give the moral message across. They're mm. really willing to like mess with people. Like people that are fans of Topanga, like I am, as this really great feminist character because in a lot of ways she is a feminist icon mm. of that time period um if you watch it over again it doesn't age as well because of how much they had to fiddle with mm. their character in service to Corey. um and like i said they have the boy meets world podcast now i think it's boy meets podcast is what they call it where it's danielle mm. will friedel um and the third one whose name i'm blanking on but they they talk about it like some of the disappointments they had as people portraying these characters. I don't think they've gotten to a very tipping a Christmas yet, uh, but it's one of the very few Christmas episodes Boy Meets World ever did. Um, mm. And I I really want to talk about it because I just, the, the visual of a It's a Wonderful Life being so much about the relationship because It's a Wonderful Life is kind of about the marriage but it's so much bigger than that. So to just focus on the mm. relationship aspect of It's a Wonderful Life and to turn it into mm. like this treaty on why purity culture is so tops. And if it's if you're not doing the purity <laughs> ring thing, you're going to end up being fat and watching the person you love married to your best friend's half-brother. Uh, that's <laughs> the cautionary tale. And at the end of the episode, it wraps up with Corey giving her and Topanga accepting the purity ring. And mm. then they have a whole episode in the next season before they get married about the will they, won't they bang during prom, essentially. And mm. it, they literally spend the whole prom episode on uh, on bang culture and whether or not Topanga and Corey are going to consummate this like weird decade long relationship they've had with each other. So it's quite a something. If we ever talk about Boy Meets World, it's quite a show to unpack mm. in a lot of different ways. Interesting. Yes, and perhaps um, in the, in our next season we might find a slot so that I can hear your full thoughts on this. Um, hmm. yeah. What well, I'm not sure what you call it. It it sounds like it's quite a cultural talking point. I I think it is. I think the I think the farther we get from when Boy Meets World is on the air, mm. the more it becomes the nostalgia angle because it doesn't hold up as well. There are some it, really great subplots like the dad mm. has this subplot in about the middle of the show mm. where he gives up his really stable job to pursue his dream um yes. and there's actually a really big thing about the two parents having to live with the consequence of his action 
Now, it's not too big a consequence. They still keep their house and everything works out because it's mm. the sitcom thing. But there's a really great episode about making choices that they kind of sneak into the middle of the show. Um, the, 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 adult, the adult Matthews um, have this really great relationship. When we talk about Boy Meets World, they really want to frame it as this is a show that at its core when it works, is really about the idea of how adults mentor the younger people in their lives. Because mm. Jonathan, Mr. Feeney, the older hunter dad in some ways, and the Matthews parents are really strong, really moral-centered characters without hitting you over the head with it. And mm. it's a real shame that this show wasn't better and that Girl Meets World wasn't better because they did a spinoff called Girl Meets World about Corey and Topanga's kids, but they like dial Corey up to 13 and the wacky meter. It's kind yeah. of like the TV show coupling when the one guy left. So they had to make the main character into like the kind of weird storyteller character and it didn't work. Girl Meets mm. World really ramps up the wackiness of Corey's mm. character and it doesn't serve at all. It it does sound like it hasn't held up as well as say Sabrina. Um, we watched oh, yeah. Sabrina earlier this year and like, you know, there was some dated references and what have you. But generally, I felt that it was quite a nice sitcom to be watching and I didn't feel that there was anything that really detracted yeah. from the viewing yeah. experience. Similar to how Golden Girls, um, yeah, again, some dated references within it, but it's the strength of the writing and the characters and the personalities that really yeah. carry it through and it sounds like that's not unfortunately happened for yeah. boy meets world and there is um, character growth so the yeah. last of the finale yeah. of sabrina is the ultimate character growth where the women in sabrina's life are like you don't have to choose magic you don't have to choose chaos boy meets world yeah. never gets that even in the finale even in the finale where like topanga and Corey are moving to new york wherever they're moving to they bring Sean with them because heaven forbid they let Sean grow as his own person. They basically friends him where he's going to have like the in-law apartment in their new place for some reason. It's it's this weird thing of like they were so enamored with the idea of a sitcom they didn't let anyone grow. Um, and the next episode we're going to talk about for Family Matters almost has that same problem, but not quite. Uh, mm. for varying reasons but yeah it's it's a very Topanga Christmas it'll make you really hungry for pancakes because mm. for a weird reason like pancakes and pancake toppings are like a major part of the plot of the thing that Topanga steamrolls over so be prepared to want pancakes if you end up watching a very <laughs> Topanga Christmas <laughs> mm. and I feel a point I should touch upon from you mentioned about morals um that Boy Meets World was very much about sort of like the adults helping to teach the kids um, about growth and life lessons and such. And from what I've seen of my reading um, of it's a, it's a Wonderful Life, like leading a very morally sound life does seem to be um, quite a strong lesson within the film. Would you say that so? I would say it. I don't know that that message comes across. It's kind of like the Wizard of Oz message of there's no place like home. Mm. The idea of leaving Oz to go back to Kansas in the Depression era is actually very horrifying, <laughs> but it sounds very <laughs> sweet. So It's a Wonderful Life really is about this guy that's the moral center of the town. And mm. so when I say moral center, when we talk about morality, we talk about morality in sitcom, it's always what's good what is honest what is truth telling like the idea of a white lie for self-preservation the idea of queerness on these shows and hiding your queerness because it may not be safe to come out doesn't occur on programs like this there is no gray morality anytime someone might join a gang the gang is like the ultimate bad bully of the series there's no gray area in in these and so i it's a very particular type of pure morality where mm. there's consequence but that consequence is going to end up having like a casio keyboard background and it's only going to be about like 
someone maybe getting grounded and having electronics taken away and then learning a lesson. Because no one on these shows are bad and evil except for like the guy that wanted to drag Sean into a cult on Boy Meets World. That 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 dude was not good, but he was in there for one very special episode. That's the other special episode we should do for Halloween, the sitcom cult episode. Because every sitcom Ooh. had a cult episode. Like in yes. the nineties, they were they were all for real worried about the cults. And every sitcom, the sitcom episode of Boy Meets World was probably better than the sitcom episode of Sabrina, but that was also not Sabrina in its strongest season. So we'll have to we'll have to talk about that next time. But the the nineties sitcom cult episode is kind of amazing, and it actually goes back to a cult episode thing they did in the sixties and seventies on. So it's really cool. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, mm, yes let's put that uh, let's put that idea on the uh pin board and revisit it uh, later yes. on our on our little it's always sunny pin board that we've got with all the red thread it looks like a conspiracy board um <laughs> so where's the next thread in this conversation go sir so we're only going back a little bit to the beginning of 1997 and so this is season eight of family matters before the original Harriet has left and they've had to recast. Uh, the ninth season is the final season of the show, so we're very near the end of the show. And season eight is really known as the season of Steve Urkel. He has ingratiated himself in the family. He's definitely marrying Laura. We just don't know when. And almost all the episodes involve some sort of his contraption that he creates not working. So he's got the porta potty that transforms him into Stefan, and they've now split off into two characters. So Julio White can be like the cool version of himself sometimes. This is a time travel episode based on greed. So this is the uh, idea of the material version of It's a Wonderful Life and the idea of money and what it does and how American money corrupts, even though you need a certain amount of money to live in Chicago in the kind of house this family has. Um, and the idea is that Steve's kind of time transporter watch which looks kind of like a power ranger zeo watch goes <laughs> haywire and it sends carl back into the past with steve but before steve and carl can get back into the present carl leaves himself like a note with different stock tips to buy so when they go back into the present carl winslow has made himself this like super rich guy and his like family lives in a penthouse and his wife Harriet is cheating with the butler and his kids all hate him. And so <laughs> this is the It's a Wonderful Life, Don't Get Focused on Money episode, because essentially <laughs> it's like Carl having to go back in time again and retconning everything that would have like given his family security and wealth, but took away the love. And the love is the most important thing on Family Matters. So mm -hmm. money corrupts and corrupts absolutely. And father time, literally, there's no like plot synopsis. No one has dug into the episode, but it's literally about Carl, for some reason, being very greedy and IBM stock tips leading him to a life of immense wealth. But also his family hates him and his wife cheats on him because he becomes like a Scrooge type character and obsessed with money. He becomes the bank manager and it's a it, wonderful life, essentially. It's, it's not, yeah, it's, but it's a wonderful life thing without, without the mm. dream sequence and without the angels. It's all about like, yes. this is what happens when you have lots of money. Everybody's unhappy and cheating on each other. Kind of. Didn't thing. you, didn't you say that in the boy meets world spe um, Christmas special that the girlfriend ended up with the half brother and they were successful? Uh, I don't remember if they were successful, but Corey was fat and Jack was still hot, just a little older. And right. Sean's older step, older step half brother Jack is yes. his basic role is to be Eric's best friend because it's more age appropriate, and also just be super hot. And so Topanga ends up with hot Jack as opposed to fat Corey. So there's a lot right. of fat phobia in the episode. It's very uncomfortable for mm. for people of larger sizes. Okay. But yeah. I was just going to say that it's interesting that um, it almost feels like the mor a shared moral between the two Christmas specials is um, people being successful doesn't necessarily lead to actual happiness itself. Almost like they're saying, you you know, it, you may try to find success, but it won't lead to happiness as a sort of moral. 
it's never clear if it's about the fact that Caro gamed the mm. system by giving his past self stock tips, or mm. if it's a money is the root of all evil moral. But mm. the idea that this family has to struggle for wealth and has to live in this house um, in Chicago, where they're crammed to the gills, and as it gets older, uh, as, as the kids get older, they bring in newer, younger kids, so they get even more crammed in the gills. In fact, they get so crammed to the gills, they have one daughter that disappears completely because they write her out of the show, and they never mention her again, which is super fun. Uh, one, of the, one of the kids on Family mm. Matters legit disappears. Like, she goes upstairs to do something one episode, and she's never spoken of again. And then they bring in, like, uh, one, uh, I, I think that's the season they bring in Richie to, like, replace her because he's cute and young and has some fun catchphrases. But she goes upstairs and she disappears and she's was never heard from again! I was going like, to say, I'd heard of an, an infamous American scene where a child goes upstairs and they just never are mentioned again. I think it's been parodied, parodied in several things. Yes, but it's this show. Uh, she was one of my favorite characters because she did a Halloween episode where she played Diana Ross and she was like Central Park Diana Ross in like the rain scene. So she just comes in after trick-or-treating going, I love you, I love you. And she just bounces up the stairs in this great Diana Ross moment. And it's so gay and it's so good. And uh, that's not the episode she disappears on. But she definitely oh. like disappears from the show completely, um, and it's just never spoken of because she was like becoming a teen and she wasn't as cute as the younger ones and she wasn't as interesting as the older ones. But uh, Family Matters, as Family Matters did allow the kids to grow, but it made the wrong lessons. So Laura is the interest of Steve Urkel, who is like this ultimate nerd archetype and very mm. uncomfortable upon rewatch, very stalky, very much like wear down the woman and she'll be yours someday. Like the opposite <laughs> of Corey and Topanga. Uh, but the point we get to season eight, he's so well loved and he's ingratiated himself so much into the family. It's just a matter of time. Like we know Laura's gonna church gonna choose Steve over Stefan because there's like an authenticity thing. But this episode, Father Time, is so much about this later season of Family Matters where it's so much about something happens that is wacky because Steve makes it so, and then the family reacts. So this show is really falling apart at this point in season eight, and this kind of time travel, stock tip, mm. money is not the answer sort of thing is just really kind of showing how everything, everything kind of wrong with the show at this point, getting away from its very authentic roots uh mm. the first season of family matters is actually very good but it's not reviewed well because steve isn't a main character in it so people don't really know how to take it but i actually think earlier family matters is a better show because it feels more like a family experience that is authentic in trying mm. to grow and learn and love once again while being crammed into this house together in chicago so mm. Yeah, it's it's Father Time. It's from early in '97. It's not a Christmas episode per se, but it has that "It's a Wonderful Life, Be Careful mm. What You Wish For" vibe. Uh, in this case, it's a "Be Careful About Money" because if you get it, it will ruin everything you love. Oops. Essentially, <laughs> like Essentially. stay in middle class, kids, because you don't want to have a lot of money because it'll make your wife cheat on you is the moral of this episode like there's not even an apology casio keyboard in this episode it's just carl screws up and then they have to go back and fix it so that his wife won't cheat on him and his kids will love him again uh and that is basically <laughs> 23 minutes that that is the 23 minutes of that essentially so yeah good god <laughs> Uh, so before we do the third episode, so we've done uh, we've done the relationship angle of It's mm. a Wonderful Life with Boy Meets World. We've done the greed angle of A Wonderful Life uh, with Family <laughs> Matters. I don't know how else to call it. It's really about greed because for some reason Carl mm. is very, very pressed about money in this episode when it's very rare for that to have come up in Family Matters or in most sitcoms. Except for like Roseanne, where them being in poverty was a big showcase for most of the show. Money's not really a thing sitcoms are concerned with unless it's a money scheme. So like Perfect Strangers and Golden Girls with like scheme episodes are part of it. Golden Girls does a little bit of that 
Um, mm. They're more subtle about it, but it's definitely still not a show about money. Um, mm. So before I talk about the Growing Pains version of this, which is about family and togetherness, and it's a very Americana-based, uh, I want to give you a little bit of background information of why It's a Small World kind of in sitcom land sounds like it's a Christmas carol. It's because It's a Small World, the film, is mm. based on a short story from 1943 called The Greatest Gift by Philip Van Doren Stern, which is okay. based on a Christmas carol. So the reason these sound very mm. Christmas carol-like is because the source material is loosely based. It's very much that Brookbeck Mountain thing where it goes from a 13-page short, short story to a three-hour movie. Um, results vary. Obviously, Brookback <laughs> is much... It, it's as good as a source material, but 13 pages to three hours is a big stretch. Uh, I have yes. not read The Greatest Gift, but knowing it's based on A Christmas Carol makes a lot of It's a Small World or It's a Wonderful Life make sense. Um, mm. Again, there's this kind of through line of morality, and we see it especially in this final episode I'm going to talk about. Um, I have I have tried actually to steer very hard away from Growing Pains, because I don't want to give Kurt Cameron more airtime. Um, I've talked mm. a little bit more about Full House, because Candace Cameron Bure, uh, Candace Cameron Bure has been less effective in the world than Kirk, even though they're both kind of nightmare people now. Um, but there was no way to do It's a Small... Uh, there was no way to do an It's a Wonderful Life episode without talking about this episode of Growing Pains. So Growing Pains is done three Christmas episodes in their run. And this one is called The Kid. And The Kid is actually reportedly an homage to the, uh, I think it's a Charlie Chaplin movie, it might be Buster Keaton, but The Kid is a movie from the 1920s that's about an orphan. And it's very much like a silent film of its time. And The Kid is about this homeless kid that has run away from home before Leonardo DiCaprio is cast in the show. So this is season two, long before Leo is a homeless kid in Mike Seaver's class that eventually becomes a member of the family. So the kid, the plot of the kid is thus. And I just want you to stick with me because I have to explain this plot to you if you've never actually seen this episode. Okay. So <laughs> the episode opens up with uh, a very, very moral lesson for Ben about the true meaning of Christmas. And the Ben is the younger brother. They haven't had uh, their fourth kid yet. So Ben is the youngest of the family. He's learning what Christmas is. He just wants a whole bunch of stuff. He's basically Calvin if Calvin from Hobbes was a real person and didn't have a stuffed tiger. Uh, season two is also when the middle kid, uh, played by Tracy Gold, didn't have anorexia yet, so they could still they still showed her around food, but they were okay. really they were really giving her the complex um, at the time. Um, actually, the still for this is for some reason a picture of Tracy Gold decorating a gingerbread horse which is kind of weird because she's not the main star of this episode i don't even remember in her in this episode except that she's a member of the family uh but so basically ben gets uh, ben who's the youngest son gets high roaded about the true meaning of christmas not being about presents and i don't remember exactly how this happens but ben meets a homeless girl somehow who is a runaway from home from her family and we never find out why and he invites her for christmas dinner or a christmas weekend he invites her to come to the house so this girl who calls herself nancy reagan as a moniker uh comes <laughs> to the house it's very it's very this is episodes from 1986 so a nancy reagan reference makes a lot of sense in 86 mm, so yeah so this girl who calls herself nancy reagan comes to the house they have dinner. There's a big moral lesson. Everyone is super nervous except for Ben, who can't see the red flags. She steals all their Christmas stuff, a la the Grinch. And you, oh. think, she, you think she's run out with it, but the end of the episode is that the Seavers love and family and togetherness were so powerful, she leaves their gift on the front porch and runs to a payphone to call her father to come pick her up and bring her home for Christmas. Like, I had to end the episode with this. This is such a weird, like, schmaltz fest. We never hear about 
uh, Denise's family. Her real name is Denise, by the way, but she calls herself Nancy Reagan throughout the episode. Mm-hmm. So I would say her name is Reagan, like a mm-hmm. like a reference to uh, the actresses. But like, mm-hmm. we never hear about why she ran away from home. Just that she ran away. But then she like the end of the episode is her tearfully calling her father and being like, "Daddy, it's Denise. Come pick me up." And so it's like this perfect like there's snow everywhere and it's super cold and she's ran away from home and Ben just brings this homeless person in for dinner and the whole family is weirded out but they go along with it because they don't want to be wrong again in their moral message and so Mm -hmm. this is like it's almost so bad it's high art it's like we have a homelessness problem in America in the 80s but the reason we have a homeless this problem is because people aren't close enough with their families question mark seems to be the approach that uh growing pains takes with Mm. this and again this is earlier in the series so i don't think kirk cameron had been converted to christianity yet so he wasn't getting like weird and moralistic i think he's Mm. still super cool kind of sexy badass boyfriend mike siever uh, Mike, Mike Seaver and Sean from Boy Meets World have a lot in common in a lot of mm. ways. Uh, and, and so the, the moral of this is don't invite a homeless person over unless you have a really strong family because <laughs> then, you, then you won't get your Christmas gift stolen all the way, just a little bit of the way. And there is this moment in the episode in Act 3 before they discover the presence on the porch when you really think that this girl, Nancy Reagan, has just run off with all their Christmas presents. You really think it's going in a different direction. Um, it's actually shocking how close the reveal is to not happening because it's pushed It's pushed in time, but as far as it can go before the audience like loses interest with it altogether. It's very much like Grinch on the top of Mount Crumpet. It's, it's very much like, mm. this is It's a Wonderful Life, definitely pushing not the monetary aspect so much, but pushing like the moralistic center of town doing mm. good will bring you goodness sort of thing it, it's it's very much like special episodes set at christmas um and it's pretty much quintessential sitcom because it's a one-off character we're never going to mm. see again but who had no. <laughs> a lot of problems that are never explained it's just this nebulous oh well she's a homeless kid, the same age as Ben, that Ben, the youngest child, is bringing home, and all of a sudden, Ben has all the control over this episode. The parents never, there's never a scene with the parents asking Nancy Reagan about her life or herself or why she ran away. Like, nobody will actually ask the question that makes them all nervous. Like, it's the conversation nobody's willing to have, but, like, legit, Mm. there is no, they, they just have this Rando homeless person we're never gonna see for, hear from again, see again, never shows up in any of the growing pains post uh movie because they did like three growing pains movies after the show ended. Like one oh, of the wow. ones is like the mom who's a news anchor, like runs for Congress or something like that. And one of them <laughs> and one of them, Ben has a drug problem and is like in a van chase or something. Uh, and Leonardo DiCaprio was too good for this show. So after he got uh, really famous, I don't think he ever came back for any of the movies. But yeah, they did like three movies after the show. And we never hear from Denise again. She's like homeless. And then she's back with her family. And it was just that easy. Did they actually show that like you saying that she was bringing her dad at the end of the episode? But yeah. did they actually show the family was aware that? She rang her dad and went home. Uh, no, the Seaver, the Seavers never see her again. I cannot express enough that we never hear from this character again. The Seavers ask Ooh. no questions about her life, and they never attempt to find her. And if they did, they never show it because this is like mm. this is a traditional Christmas episode. So it's the halfway point of the season. So they go on Christmas break after this. So we come back in like February. Mm. Or in late January. So, like, yeah, we never hear about what happens to Denise if her dad gets to her in time. Oh, the Seaver does never ask any questions. They don't call the cops. No one tries to figure out why Denise may have ran away if she was in a bad situation. 
No one tries. She's just this random girl that's hopeless that Ben mm. meets and invites to their family dinner for some. I, there's probably a scene which is why he does it, but like it's cause and effect of family does super heavy moralistic. Christmas is not mm. about stuff. Ben's response is over the top because he's like an eight year old, ten year old kid at that point. Like he's yes, just he's just uh, um, memorializing and living the lesson, living the truth. You know, I mean, you know, you could cho choose to imagine that there is a scene where the parents do talk to the child, the homeless child, Denise, separately. But I mean, by the sounds of it, I'd almost question like how moralistic this episode is if like they didn't show any attempt by the family to try and help her in some way. Sort of like, oh, come in, have some food. OK, goodbye. Yeah, no one's willing to ask again. the questions. Not... This is not the worst golden. This is not the worst growing pains Christmas episode. The worst growing pains Christmas episode is the one where so the dad is a psychiatrist and he works out of the home. And the first Christmas episode they do, and I think season one, is literally the dude is in a Santa costume and wants to off himself. And the episode revolves around getting him to not off himself while preparing for Christmas. Uh, it's it's bad. It's real bad. Uh, but the kid is much close. So the episode that we're talking about, the kid is much closer to the it's a wonderful life thing more than the suiciding Santa that is trying to off himself by dying in the Seaver family chimney. Mm. Um, it's it's bad. It's real bad. <laughs> the growing pains <laughs> didn't do a lot of holiday episodes mm. for a very particular reason, although I will say there anthology halloween episode where they all told scary stories to each other was pretty good um but their christmas episodes were not because the show was so much about the family dynamic mm. in a way that even family matters wasn't um mm. i i can imagine it would have been a much better show especially if kirk cameron had not been converted to christianity because he started as the most popular character, he started messing with production the moment he was converted. Wait. And that's why you start to see the decline in the show in later seasons. But in this early season stuff, he's still reigned in a bit and he's still like doing the job as Mike because he hasn't been converted yet. Like, right. I don't know who converted him, but the person that converted Kurt Cameron has so much to answer for, including why I can't have a growing pains box set because i do not want to support the cameron family and i'm kind of right. miffed about it because it's a trash show but it was a trash show i loved for a long time and i'm real sad i can't have a box set of it oh so uh was it such a pain but as you know you're not in a way supporting with this because this is more of a cultural discussion and such so at least you can air your thoughts here sir without it's having true. to worry about that also, everybody was real surprised that Alan Thicke had a hit show. There's a reason they made that joke in The Golden Girls. This mm. was the hit show that Alan Thicke had was Growing Pains. And everybody well, was surprised because nobody expected Alan Thicke to have a hit show at any point. <laughs> uh, I will say I absolutely love the mom. Joanna Kearns, I believe, is mm. the woman who plays the mom. And she has such an ambition to be a newscaster and to work outside the home. And it's never played like she can't do it because she's a woman. Like, mm. she's got a very, like, Murphy Brown going out there and doing the damn thing energy. And I have to say the mom in Growing Pains is incredibly kick-ass, does not take any bull. She is, like, fabulous mold-breaking mm. female character on TV. It's just, mm. in this show, what? she's very much eclipsed by her children. Mm. I mean, it, I mean, the woman ran for congress so i mean she it sounds like ambition was not something she lacked it's true <laughs> um but it's uh, so going back to the whole thing like the comparisons to it's a wonderful life to this episode uh, again i find it very strange that the moral lesson that they were trying to teach here sort of only went part of the way because in a sense, it was almost like they were like doing the lesson, like as a warning, like oh, don't um, get so consumed by the commercialist 
commercialization of Christmas, but it doesn't go really any way to the other side of the message where, you know, you should try to help others and put yourself out there for them. Whereas It's a Wonderful Life, from what I understand, was about um, the, how the lead character had such a positive impact on the lives of other people that he inter that he met and what his impact did for those people whereas it doesn't feel like quite goes that way with this episode by the sounds of it but in a way slightly with denise um calling her dad and like hopefully they went you know things got a bit better for her from there and she didn't end up stealing the presents and committing a crime but at the same time like they didn't like from what I could see, from what it sounds like, they didn't actually show that sort of Christmas spirit, almost. Yeah, it's it's interesting too because I didn't actually watch this episode. I, I should watch this episode specifically before I talked about this. But so, Growing Pains was always about the moral at the end of the story. Every episode is like, this is the problem, and this is how we're going to fix it. Like. Tracy Gold's character may not get to go to prom, and the reveal is that her boyfriend got, like, a second job in secret so he could pay for her, like, prom corsage. So there's always a tidy wrap-up. This episode starts with the tidy wrap-up and then devolves. And I can't recall when Reagan enters, uh, but mostly her character, her homelessness isn't really taken. It's taken seriously, but it's a thing that's not spoken about. There's like this palpable unease in the family of having her there because they don't, mm -hmm. not because they want to help her, but because they don't want Ben to get the wrong message or find out they're being hypocritical. And it's like, they didn't know in the writer's room how to write the story. It's not played for laughs, even though Nancy Reagan is a really great one-liner and Denise spends most of the episode being sassy. But later, when we get Leonardo DiCaprio in as the homeless kid, he's also very sassy. Like, he comes basically in as an orphan whose father comes in midway through his first season to, like, take him home. And then he wants to stay with the Seavers. Leonardo DiCaprio basically is playing, like, the Fran Fine nanny character in this universe and has to make a choice to stay with the Seavers. We never hear from Denise again. We never see Denise again. We don't see Denise's dad come to pick her up. We don't know why she ran away. It's never asked because asking the question means you're opening up the box of why are we helping or not helping? And like, why is it this one year we're doing this? Like, it's it's very much, it, it, it's such a small microcosm of the It's a Wonderful Life story that it doesn't work in the same way, but it's a, it's a Wonderful Life narrative. Mm -hmm. It's about the... Because one of the things about George Bailey is the idea of he feels so empty when he's contemplating jumping off the bridge. You know, mm. we don't know why Denise is homeless, just that she is. The homelessness thing is her personality, except for being sassy. Um, and we never see her again, but we do see the actress who plays uh, this character again. So the actress is uh, played by Haley Todd. Uh, whose character is just called the kid in the credits, by the way. Uh, but she was also in Star Trek The Next Generation. She was on The Golden Girls. She was on Sabrina the Teenage Ooh. Witch. And she was on Lizzie McGuire. So, so Haley Todd, actually, even though she didn't have like the longest running career ever, um, played kind of these interesting, iconic parent characters later. So she plays... Uh, cousin Marigold from the Halloween episode. She's Amanda's mom. So whenever we have an Amanda episode of uh, Sabrina the Teenage Witch, she's Cousin Marigold. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, and she's also Blanche's niece from Lucy from the first season or the second season, The Golden Girls. Uh, the one that Blanche has to be like, honey, don't I never give it away for free uh, kind of thing. So it, it's an interesting thing is that Haley Todd plays these uh, family characters again, 
In Star Trek mm-hmm. The Next Generation, she plays uh, Data's daughter, Lull. And so I'm sure I'm getting the name wrong. Uh, but mm-hmm. she plays Data's daughter. So she always plays these family-centric characters. And the kid is probably the one that people don't know they know her for the most. She's also mm-hmm. done, like, Murder, She Wrote, and she did an American Girl movie. Um, okay. But, but I, I want to say, besides being Jill McGuire, the mom from Lizzie McGuire, and probably Marigold, likely mm-hmm. if you follow Haley Todd, you know her as the kid. Because I think that's probably her strongest one mm. episode stint because again we never hear from her again we don't no. actually know if she's okay we know she went to a payphone again and called her father and for those of yes. you that are younger that don't know payphones were things that existed before cell phones because <laughs> you didn't always have a phone with you um and it's something we very much take for granted but but yeah i mm. couldn't do and it's a wonderful life episode without talking about the kid um yeah. Because I, I always think about this episode when I think about Christmas episodes of sitcoms, especially because mm-hmm. because it's such a strain at the formula is always this is the moral we want people watching this to learn and to emulate. And this mm-hmm. really pulls at the moral of you shouldn't be materialistic at Christmas because that's not what it's about. Because when Ben brings yeah. a homeless person in who's clearly like there's they they clearly write this character to be this unsafe, sassy, very undermining type. And it's it's just it just really strains at the formula of what a sitcom, especially a sitcom Christmas episode is. And I just I, I just think about it all the time. And I and I just I don't know where to I don't know where to do with it, but it's very much like a this exists in canon pop culture and it's such a weird episode, especially for Christmas. Hmm. Yes, and it certainly sounds like, so we've had three examples now of how sort of like the wonderful, It's a Wonderful Life formula was translated into various sitcoms for, you know, one-off episode plots and such. And how they've implemented it does sound quite interesting. Um, I'm getting some notions that I've probably seen other sitcoms they've tried to replicate such a formula maybe some with a christmas centric theme to them um although it's easy probably to get lost in the um christmas carol references as well because of the crossover of concepts there um and so it does really it, it does feel interesting that some of them are christmas themed and some aren't necessarily christmas themed but rather sort of like very much a what if kind of concept. Yeah. Um, it's, it's quite in, intriguing to think of the fact that one of the most popular Christmas movies ever could also be viewed as both a time travel movie and also a alternative history slash alternative what if movie. And what's interesting, too, is that It's a Wonderful Life isn't actually a well-loved movie. People have canonized it as being well-loved. Mm. But it was something that just happened to be on TV, which is what made it popular. It just mm. happened to work because of syndication, whereas Wizard of Oz grew in mm. popularity because it was put on TV. It's a Wonderful Life was foisted on us because no one liked it, so it was free. So cable providers and, like, people that had like the first three channels could actually have something to watch on Christmas. So like the schmaltz and the saccharine and the sweetness of It's a Wonderful Life almost works better in this 23 minute instead of the two hour runtime. The 23 minute sitcom formula almost feels it better because sitcoms live on the idea of shorthand and something about It's a Wonderful Life is a very shorthand movie. It's the idea of Dude is, dude is framed for messing up. It's such a big script that he kind of wishes he'd never been born. But dude was so important to the town where he lived that him not being born has riotous consequences. And then he is sorry and he repents. And the angel that helped him got his wing, got his wings, and the town rallies around him. And it's it's this kind of weird story about community that when you distill it to sitcom 
you have to do it about the family unit because you can't really make it about them. There there are other better Christmas episodes of Family Matters, especially. Uh, And their version of It's a Wonderful Life is actually a January episode, so it comes after Christmas. So it comes Mm. after their holiday break. Um, And it comes very late in the show, too. So Carl being greedy is not something we'd actually seen before. They added a lot of greed to his character to make the episode happen. And it's like they brought homelessness into Growing Pains for one episode and then much later for a couple of seasons to showcase Mm -hmm. a thing. But it's not about homelessness. It's not Scrooge being confronted by why working houses are bad or why emaciated street children live under the coat of uh, goes to Christmas present. It, mm. It's kind of used as a shorthand object lesson, and it almost works better as a shorthand object lesson, because when you start to pry apart the idea <laughs> of George Bailey being so central to this town without it, the whole town falls to the corrupt banker guy. Like, at no point in any other time was any, were any of the other characters moralistic or had that kind of backbone. It, it, if you start pulling at the thread... It doesn't work as well in a two-hour concept. It works much better, even if the message doesn't quite hit as a sitcom. And I think it's part of why I love sitcoms is shorthand is a really great way to easy to learn to write. And I didn't know that I was doing it at the time. Um, (laughs) But I've always been a big fan of sitcoms. Something about the formula I find very soothing um, Mm. in a lot of ways. Hmm. Wow. Uh, I think that we're slowly but surely reaching the end of this episode, good sir. It's so, true, and it, I've almost had my fill of eggnog, or as I like <laughs> to call it, rum with some eggnog. <laughs> rum with a dash of egg. Rum with a dash of egg. That's how, uh, or rum ham with a dash of egg, if you're an It's oh, Always wow. Sunny in Philadelphia fan. <laughs> um, so, did you have any concluding points? Um to wrap up this uh, discussion with at the moment? Uh, I think my concluding point would be, uh, as always, I love talking with the people that enjoy our podcast. Mm. And so there are going to be other holiday or non-holiday episodes that have in its wonderful Mm. life feel. Uh, We talked about three of them, but there are more out there. Which sitcom or even like miniseries episodes can you think of that have this It's a Wonderful Life feel? Like, were there cartoons that had it? Uh, can you think of like an anime manga episode that had it? Uh, what other Christmas movie do you wish we'd talked about other than It's a Wonderful Life? Do you absolutely hate It's a Wonderful Life? Do you love It's a Wonderful Life? <laughs> and we're wrong, and you love the saccharin, and it's part of your tradition. Um, I think those are all things that I would like to end with the invitation as we close out mm. season two, if you can believe it or not, as we close out season mm. two, an invitation for people to kind of Come and talk and talk about, uh, did you remember these episodes of Boy Meets World, Family Matters, and Growing Pains? Or were you like, oh, I don't remember that at all. Though I have to go watch them. Um, <laughs> which is perfectly fine with me either. Hmm. Oh, excellent. Uh, well, I shall be going off to enjoy the Christmas um, special of Ghosts when it comes out this year. Um, I know a bunch of our re- listeners will probably be more interested in the Doctor Who Christmas special when that lands. Um, I mean, there's just something really nice about a good Christmas special. Um, it, it, you know, it's sort of um, usually a self-contained um, festive version of what some of your favorite shows. Um, but also there's something quite nice in the familiarity of the of the holiday traditions incorporated into them. Uh, and so, I'm always big on zoo lights myself. I love going to a zoo at night when it's super cold and they put out Christmas <laughs> lights and you can't see any of the other animals and it costs you $20 more than trying to get into the regular zoo. Big woo. fan of zoo lights. That's my favorite thing. Uh, uh, well, I hope everyone listening has a lovely time this year. Um, we will be back in 2024 with a whole host of new topics, which we will probably be brainstorming about the next month or so to figure out what we want to come back with on the bang. Um, But until that lovely time, I think it's about time for us to sign off, isn't it, sir? 
All right. And I am going to sign off with a season greetings, a joyous Noel, and <laughs> a happy 12 days for all of you that celebrate the solstice, uh, because 12 days mm. of Christmas. Uh, beware of large boxes containing birds, because once you start opening the first day, you're going to get like 12 days of birds and also cows for some reason. Who knows why? Uh, but I also want to wish you a happy holidays, Magnus. Uh, I much appreciate your mm -hmm. co-hosting, companionship, and your Aww. verb as it is. Oh, and it's always an absolute pleasure to listen to you, sir, and find out various new things that I will ha hold up my hands and didn't say I knew know, knew about. So all of these new little tidbits and bits of information is always much appreciated. I am always happy to help. I am always here for you. And I hope everyone has a good and safe holiday season. Uh, please remember to uh, drink responsibly if you're going to imbibe. And of course, if you're of age to imbibe, um, stay safe, stay warm, stay dry, and stay curious. And we'll see you again for season three of Everything is Gay. Even the straight stuff. If you can believe it in 2024, who thought we'd get to 2024? <laughs> Well, on to 2025 then.